Kaz, what's this like? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> The GT Sensor Alloy is a true trail bike with 130mm of travel and 29 inch wheels. To glance at its geometry chart, you can see that it is a little bit shorter than some of the more aggressive bikes on test, although it does have many similarities with both the Vitus and the Marin, both in terms of travel as well as some key dimensions such as a head angle. But what does that look like on the trail? Well, let's find out with Kaz and Dario. So those the details on the GT sensor. This is a real kind of true trail bike with 130 mil of rear travel and coming in at 2,600 bucks. Kaz, what's this bike like to climb? At climbing position, you're very upright. This has a really high rise bar and along with a fairly tall stack port. So you kind of get that upright, almost like comfort bike position, which it is comfortable. So just for clarity, do people put high stack heights and high rise bars on for comfort or is it for a particular ride characteristic? It kind of depends what you're going for. It does add comfort if you want to be, you know, your back is fairly straight, but typically high rise bars go, people are trying to change their weight balance, especially for steeper terrain, which isn't quite where this bike is designed for, but we'll get to that later. And does that rearward weight, well, sorry, the higher front end, which could put your weight more further towards the back of the bike, does that affect, does it mean the front wanders on climbs or does it stay relatively planted? It's relatively planted. You have long enough chain stays to balance it. I think just overall, just the general feel of the bike is more upright rather than something being racy and more hunched over. And Dario, this bike, it sounds like it's quite a yeah, comfortable upright position. Mm -hmm. Did it have, um, you know, suspension that was efficient, grippy? You know, it sounds almost like this bike could be a comfortable cruiser. How did the suspension play into that? I'd put it more on the efficient end of the spectrum. The shock is a three position lever, so you could lock it out on the climbs if you wanted to, but I, for the most part, just ran it right in the middle, like up and down, and it felt quite good. Um, open, I didn't find it was like bogging into the travel a bunch. And even then it wasn't super duper grippy. It's definitely just like a pedal quick and you know move efficiently kind of bike. Pretty much all the bikes here have relatively hard compound tires, which do tend to roll faster, but the GT also has a faster tread pattern. Um, I think it's the dissector in the rear and a DHF in the front. And those are relatively quick rolling. Yeah, as far as tr overall traction goes, I'd say this doesn't have quite as much traction from the suspension. Um, it doesn't, you know, some bikes have a little more soft drop the top, kind of really dig in. It feels like it's grabbing at all the rocks and roots and things. This one definitely more stays up higher in its travel. And so you feel, you know, it feels like it wants to accelerate forward, but it's not absorbing all those bumps. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? How we think about how well a bike climbs. Sometimes actually what we consider to be a good climbing bike actually climbs on things best that aren't real mountain biking techy chundery trails. But what we want to know as well is how it handles the descending section. So let's get on to how this bike descends. So in a lot of ways, this bike is similar to the Marin and the Vitus in that it's a sort of you know, true trail bike, perhaps. Same head tube angle at 65.5 degrees. But Dario, what were the real key takeaways from how this bike descended? I think in a few ways, this is like the most conservative bike we had when it came to descending capabilities. It didn't feel like sketchy necessarily, but it definitely feels like it has the shortest travel of the bunch. Um, it's tied for shortest travel with the Marin, but those two bikes feel vastly different. Can you explain this bit for people at home who aren't familiar perhaps riding with all these different bikes? Mm -hmm. How is it that a bike can feel like it has less travel than sure. it does? I think maybe like one way to put it is like the support that you're getting from the suspension is different. So on this GT, it biases more towards efficiency and keeping you high up in the travel. And as a result, like when you hit bumps, it feels like you're getting more feedback from those bumps as opposed to just like cushy and like contouring to the trail. Now, Kaz, you ride a lot of these kind of true trail bikes, which now have sort of settled on that 130 mil travel maybe paired to a 140 mil fork. How is this bike to descend? And what happens when you ride it on things that are a bit outside its remit of true trail biking onto gnarlier, techier trails? Yeah, I think this bike definitely falls on the pointier side of things. You know, it does feel like you reach that edge a little bit quicker than we talked about the Marin. That bike has a pretty broad range, but this one, if you do get in some chunkier stuff or steeper terrain, you kind of feel like you're, you're pushing the limits. It can feel, I'm not gonna say scary, but you just realize that you're on a bike that shouldn't be pushed any harder. It's not one of those bikes that's like, I'm gonna let off the brakes and see what happens. It's like, I'm gonna stay on the brakes and stay in control because I don't think it's gonna be able to handle this. So I think some of that does come down to that shock tune. It just feels like a little bit firmer, like Dario was alluding to. So you're, you're noticing more of the bumps coming at you. In terms of balance, we talk about that high front end. Does that come in, does it feel relatively neutral when you're riding it? 
Do, right. Would you like the front end to be lower perhaps, or maybe a lower rise bar? I like a higher stack height generally, so it felt good to me. Um, I also kind of liked the way the chassis of the bike felt, like it was like maybe a little flexier than some of the other things, but that felt okay considering how like sporty the rest of the package was. Yeah, generally I think like well appointed, I didn't feel uncomfortable on the bike, but as Kaz said, yeah, it's just a bit pointier. Yeah, I think it does, I want to kind of clarify what pointy is, because again, it's a term we turn, toss around a lot. I would say that it almost feels like it's riding steeper, like it feels like it has a steeper head angle than yeah. it does, so it just feels a little bit more pigeonholed towards the, the lighter duty trail side I of things. I was thinking a lot more when riding this. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, you gotta focus. Yeah. So let's talk about some of those components. Now, something that caught my eye, weirdly enough, I kind of thought that we were done with this for bikes. I mean, yes, they're value, but they're still pretty expensive, several mm. thousand dollars. And it's got an internal bottom bracket. Can you just explain some of the drawbacks of an internal bottom bracket and why almost as an industry, we moved away from it? Yeah, so basically we used to have the, the internal spline bottom bracket, but it turns out those bearings don't last as long. Service isn't as easy, where everything else at a you know mid to high end bikes all have an external bottom bracket. So. Kind of interesting to see the bike at this price point. It's I would have thought they could have gone a little nicer spec there, but it also has 175 millimeter cranks. Well, this is it. Would the cranks be baked into the bottom bracket, or could you upgrade the bottom bracket in time? I mean, yeah. Eventually, if you do get a different bottom bracket, you, you have go to, to, get, you have to get new cranks too. Yeah. Cranks. So your whole package is kind of tied into that lower end system. So again, it's gonna be it's gonna cost more in the future to upgrade. Yeah. And again, the 175 mil cranks a couple of years ago would have been very common. Mm -hmm. We tend to have gone, you know, some really extreme places in some corners of the market, but largely to shorter cranks. Yeah. for more clearance, et cetera. Yeah, even five miles shorter. Like I noticed on this bike, I was hitting my pedals because I ride the same test loop over and over on lots of bikes. And I hit them a few times where I don't usually, I was like, does this have long cranks? And I looked like, oh yeah, 175. I mean, it does make a difference. Millimeters, it it but sounds it really stupid, yeah. but it does make a difference. Um, another thing I noticed was the cockpit had, you know, TRP brakes, which look kind of slightly bulkier, I think it's fair to say, as well as a non-match maker. Tech -drill brakes, same company, but Oh, they're sorry, they're not, not the racing performance, exactly. just the normal Which it makes the, the, the normal These are the more products. like entry level brakes compared yeah. to TRP makes the higher end stuff. I think yeah. the, the Tektro brakes are something that like people will definitely notice because they're atypical in the market, but uh, they work fine. They're not, they were definitely like the least powerful on the test, I would say. Um, the lever feel is pretty similar to the, to the Shimano MT420s that are on the Marin but I think I prefer the Shimano's like, quite a bit. They just feel more powerful, like better bite point, all that. And in term, terms of ergonomics, how did you get on with that shifter placement? And was that any issues at all? Yeah, I mean, Kaz brought this up and it, I think it's kind of frustrating. Like with the SX shifter, it has a very fat clamp that can't be integrated into the brakes. And so you either have to run it on the outside or the inside. And unless you have big hands, you're gonna have a pretty cramped shifter and brake situation. And we've spoken a lot about this SX and X drivetrains. It feels like, although SRAM obviously makes some really, really high-end great stuff, Shimano have the they ha have the upper hand when it comes to entry-level drivetrains at the moment. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. When you're comparing at that entry-level price point, the Shimano stuff is nicer. And we've tested dozens of bikes at this point to do some back-to-back. -back and Especially when you compare it to the Vitus's XT components, SLX, yeah. mm -hmm. vastly different in terms of performance, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. For being like the same price, you're getting a much, much better drivetrain on the Vitas. Another thing to look at is the fork has. So can you explain the experience they had with this fork and how it kind of surprised us because it wasn't necessarily what we're expecting when we saw the model on the bike. Yeah, so this has Marzocchi Z2 fork with the rail damper. And we've had pretty good experience with this one before. Um, it's pretty simple internals, but typically effective. But this one developed a little bit of bushing play and also just didn't feel quite as effective at really sucking up the hits, kind of felt um, just more... It was inconsistent. Yeah. Like, like, sometimes it was nice and quiet and like, you know, supple through stuff. And then sometimes it would really feel like square and edgy. Yeah. So, yeah, something to keep in mind. Not something you would swap out right away because obviously a new fork is expensive. And although not, you know, not a component, you did mention that the frame was actually quite quiet. Yeah, I like the frame. I think it, I mean, maybe like aesthetically polarizing, but I think it looks cool. It has like nice bearing arrangement. It's pretty simple. Seems like it'd be easy to work on aside from the bottom bracket stuff. Uh, we didn't have any bolts come loose. And yeah, generally like smart, like they, they've made locking cable ports, so it's not gonna rattle too much in the frame, which we didn't see on any of these other bikes. So that's a nice detail. One last thing to talk about. We've spoken a lot about droppers in this field test and oftentimes they've not been long enough. How was the GT? Again, it could still be a little bit longer on this one. Um, it was okay, not as short as some of the other posts, but 
I think part like on the GT because generally the bike is like a little smaller feeling like travel wise and it's like kind of on top of it. That dropper was less of an issue mm -hmm. um, just because it's like not suited towards steeper terrain quite as much as some of the other bikes are. Absolutely. Right. Well, let's get on to some pros and cons. So Dario, talk us through some of the real positives of this bike. I think that for someone who's looking to get it into trail riding on a bike that feels efficient and pedals nicely, the GT is a pretty sensible choice. Um, it's got fast rolling tires. The frame kinematics are such that like it feels pretty fast under pedaling. And you know, there are things to upgrade on the bike for sure, but you could make those upgrades and probably turn it into a more capable bike. So it feels like it's a real, someone that loves to climb as much as anything, maybe a more all-rounding riding experience than descent focused. Yeah, I think like in the spectrum of capability we have, it's definitely like the least downhill capable. Um, I'm willing to say that. So biasing towards like longer pedally rides. So, Kaz, I think we alluded to it just there, but can you talk us through some of the negatives of this bike? Yeah, I mean, if this bike is more climbing oriented, on the descent side of things is where it loses some of its shine. Uh, feels a little bit pointier, a little bit steeper, not quite as confidence inspiring. You do have to pay attention more. So someone that really wants to you know, rally on the downhills, this isn't the bike to look for. But I don't understand. It's got 475 mil of reach. It's got a super slack head angle for what it is. Uh, and it's got the same amount of travel as a couple of other bikes in this test. I know. But it just doesn't add up to doesn't same. add up. You know, I think a lot probably to do with that shock tune. There could be some other stuff going on in the frame, but I think overall it's giving you more feedback. So it doesn't have the traction. So mm -hmm. lack of traction would be one of the cons. Um, and then when the parts kit, we'll talk about value in a little bit, but I, as far as the parts on it, they are really more entry level parts on this bike than we see in some of the other ones. You know, we mentioned that internal, the, the spine bottom bracket. Even the brakes, they're not the strongest. There's just the Four. drivetrain. Four. Yeah, it all kind of adds up. You're like, ah, oh, I mean. It feels the most budgety. Exactly. So you mentioned there it was potentially one of the more budget feeling bikes on test. Based on value, out of five, how many donuts are we giving it? I'm going three donuts. I think it's a decent value, but it's definitely not the best value when you look at the parts. The frame itself, geometry, all that's good. But then all those little parts compared to the other bikes we have on test, it doesn't quite add up. Dario, not the best value bike, but who's it for? I said it earlier with the, the pros on this, I think for someone who wants like an efficient feeling bike, uh, likes to pedal, wants something that, um, you know, can handle like a variety of terrain, but isn't necessarily gonna like raise their ceiling as a rider. This is a pretty solid option. And again, like the frame it, itself is pretty nice. So if you're someone who like thinks they'll have this for a while and wants to upgrade stuff, it's not the worst option. So that is the GT Sensor Alloy. Now, please stay tuned for all the field test content we have coming out this week. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel to get all the meaningless drivel that we spout out on a daily basis.